Hey, uh, hello to everyone. Thank you so much for taking time to, to join me. Um, yes, uh, actually, I was talking just briefly about today's topic that I'm going to be focusing on with uh, Michael. Um, and uh, I was quite happy to realize that, okay, I chose the right topic. And I was kind of afraid that maybe I was a little too far off from the main sort of interest stream, if if you like, uh, in the ELT uh, industry or TESOL. But I believe quite firmly that this is one of the factors that we have to tackle or we have to face like in a serious manner. Um, like we were briefly uh, chatting before this uh, main session, um, moms are one of those the groups of people that you don't want to deal with uh, when it comes to uh, the children's English education in Korea because they could be very nosy and uh, they're sort of negative impact is getting stronger and stronger, I would say, because like uh, Michael has just met, a lot of moms are educated in English speaking countries and they think they know everything there is to know about learning and teaching English. So they sometimes they're very hard to communicate with. So, but other than that, there are some positive effects as well. So I interviewed like 38 Korean moms and uh, six English teachers, Korean English teachers, and to see how they actually perceive uh, this mom factor and how to deal with it. Okay, so let's share with you. Actually, you know what? I didn't post this uh, on my um, social media uh, accounts, uh, like Instagram, usually I do that, but, uh, this time I forgot. So I just share the uh, Cotisol, um, the, uh, what is it? The main link there. But uh, since it was all in English, probably most of my Facebook uh, friends or Instagram friends, they found it a little bit too difficult to understand. So too much text, I don't want to bother. Maybe that's one of the reasons. So it's all my fault. I should have like you know, summarized it in Korean. But anyway, let's begin. Okay. So the mom factor, do we work with it or without it? So like I said, uh, this mom factor, it could refer to uh, many different things and the range that it covers and concept wise is getting wider and wider. But uh, let's begin with how this mom factor can be defined. Well, um, I think it could be defined in different ways, but first of all, we, maybe we could start with some conventional perspective. When I first Googled the mom factor, I was surprised to see that the mom factor itself was hardly uh, seriously sort of uh, dealt with or researched in the EFL area or even TESOL area. So people didn't, I mean, that's how I found, um, what I found, people don't seem to pay much attention to the mom factor, at least in language teaching sort of industry, other than the, uh, the idea that uh, using English language at home and using English at the educational institute, what if they are so different? Is it really helpful for the children or not helpful for the children? That kind of research uh, could be found actually, uh, but uh, other than that, there was not much that I could discover. So I was thinking maybe it's something that you could uniquely found, uh, uni you can find, uh, you can find in Korea, uh, not so much in other, um, you know, English speaking or like, you know, EFL countries. So, but it is getting stronger and bigger with its impact. Uh, so I think it's time for us to, you know, pay attention to it and see how we could deal with it. And do we work with it or without it? Do we educate them or just give up on them? So conventional perspective is more like mom's English, um, like mom's involvement or engagement in their children's English at home. And as you can easily imagine in this day and age where like Corona uh, or COVID-19 is afflicting everyone on the face of the earth, uh, the people are stuck at home and they have no other choice but to spend a lot of time with our children, which could be interpreted or seen in a very desirable way. Yay, I could spend some quality time with my children. But I would dare say that uh, majority of the moms are more frustrated than happy 
to, you know, spend a lot of so much time with their children and their husbands and their like in-laws and their like family members. It's 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 huge uh, like responsibility. And some, a lot of times that responsibility is more pressure, uh, more of a pressure than just, you know, the source of happiness. So anyway, so mom's involvement in their children's education, not just English language acquisition, but in many other fields or areas, I think it should be seen in a very desirable way. Moms are paying attention to how their child is reacting to the learning process in the actual learning organizations or institutes. So I think it should be uh, something that we should be happy about. But what it means in Korean ELT is a, is a little bit different. And uh, if you have any teaching experience and in, uh, in Korea, especially private sector, and having to, if you had to deal with uh, Korean moms, I'm sure you will probably be reminded of some unpleasant memories or experiences. At least you've heard of some unpleasant stories about you know, the, having to deal with Korean moms because uh, they think they know everything. They think they should, uh, they have every right to control uh, all the syllabus design, curriculum design, and then class activities, how they uh, treat my child and, and things like that. Sometimes, a lot of times they go overboard. So mom factor, can be seen in, in those ways, I think. So the purpose of the research on mom factor for TESOLers today is to, uh, first of all, figure out the nature and the impact of the mom factor in Korean ELT and to discover the challenges and some like, strong points or some advantages of uh, English home education by Korean moms. There are some good parts, to, uh, good points too. Uh, they're not all that entirely horrible. And they're, uh, also uh, one of the purposes of, of choosing this topic from my presentation is to explore how teachers perceive. Um, one of my main interests so far has been like how teachers or what teachers believe and how they actually perceive their own occupation. And uh, they're like, uh, what is it? The, the mental or like mental attitudes towards their job and Basically, it comes from it. It's based on my belief that if teachers are are happy, if teachers change, then students change too. So I think uh, every most of the things in um, in ELT elements should be based on uh, or the start from the teacher training or teacher. I wouldn't necessarily want to say education, but uh, okay, teacher training would be probably proper. So I was very interested to see how teachers feel about this. And uh, lastly, to suggest ways to cooperate and embrace and move together, hopefully. Uh, oh. Okay, so these are the points of my presentation. So let's see what is actually going on in, um, in the mom factor in Korean ELT. When it comes to a mom factor or omma pyo yongo, omma pyo yongo can be uh, like directly uh, translated into, Korean, into English like mom's brand English education. Like there's you know all kinds of like famous brand names uh, in English sort of education uh, like industry like publishing company or the hagwans and stuff like that. So Oma Pyo Young is like mom's brand English education. Uh, mom's English education or Oma Pyo Young is concerned in Korea. There could be two major constituents. First is first group of people is the information giver, the content creator we often say, or uh, the mom's English experts who provide uh, different information, knowledge, and tips on how to raise children, uh, but how to teach more like teach children English at home through social media. So, and there are, before the social media uh, became this like prevalent and really powerful, until that time, books were there. So people used to uh, gain information and they used to learn about how to teach English to their children at home through books. So books are still there. There are tons and tons of books out there. And the uh, titles of those books are quite um, like dramatic. Like if you can't do this, don't ever imagine that your children is going to grow. Uh, children are going to grow up to become a world citizen or something like that. So almost like a threat. So you do this, you make it. Hey, I I I raise my child to become so successful as a successful English learner or like user. So can you? So I will teach you. So listen to me and pay me. <laughs> that sort of idea is, is getting like more and more prevalent, I would say. So posts and lectures on social media. So on one hand, those creators are there and on 
The other hand, maybe larger number of people are the audience mothers. They're all both mothers. And these days, quite recently, dads are becoming more and more like engaged in this, like, you know, mom's English or parents' English, I would say, education. If you could call it like sector in industry, it's getting like bigger and wider with all these business strategies uh, made by these, um, the creators to make it like bigger and more popular and more uh, influential. So there's uh, moms provide in, uh, information providers, moms information learners, and who would love to teach their children English at home. And they provide do's and don'ts to, uh, to these moms. So these are the things that you are supposed to be doing to your children. And these are the things that you should not ever, ever do. So they're being very dramatic and very strong in asserting those ideas on their content, I mean, in their contents uh, on social media. So those moms, English experts, but are they really pseudo experts? I would say no. A lot of them are highly experienced English teachers. Uh, there are some like actual school teachers who are, you know, active in this mom's English uh, industry or sector. So they set up, they are allowed to set up their own YouTube account and they constantly post up or upload their like posts about, you know, how to teach English to your children and help for these moms and dad, dads. So these are, there are some professional people who know what they're talking about. And there are some uh, not so professional uh, but still they call themselves mom's English experts who are very appealing and quite charismatic. But a lot of times um, they don't sound as if they know what they were talking about. And people are the audience moms. They do listen to them. They're so absorbed in their sort of contents. So they actually believe them like, like idol star. A lot of them have become the idol stars among moms. So, is it really fun all the time to those moms who watch the content on YouTube or Instagram and they're so fascinated to learn so much from these content creators? Is it fun all the time? Not so much. According to the findings of my research this, uh, research this times, uh, I have actually talked to many moms through uh, for the past like 20 some, no, actually I would say 30 some years. So I've been in this business or like industry for like long enough to understand. I believe I still have so much more to learn, but these moms are so desperate, but they don't want to talk about it openly. That's why they just go to all the social media, like, you know, late at night and listen to the lectures and, you know, start thinking, okay, what am I supposed to be doing to teach English to my child using the tips that I just learned from these creators? So it's, it's, it's being done in a very like individual base, not like open discussion. They do sometimes open uh, have open discussion on the web, but they're not being candid enough because they don't want to let other people know that their child is suffering. So they want to show them that they're like being successful. So that's another sort of psychological uh, factor that um, I wouldn't dare to touch upon here. So uh, the point here that I like to make is um, it, it's nothing but the source of stress to these moms who are already heavily stressed out in this uh, you know, pandemic era. So English education is another they're like huge responsibility they are willing to take on, but a lot of times they are forced to take on. So when it comes to English education, I think it's a little bit different how it's seen, uh, like uh, it de depend I mean, depends on where you're coming from. I've, when I talked to the, okay, I had a chance to discuss this or some using artificial intelligence in English education with, uh, with, with the CEO in American company. And he kept saying, we came up with this artificial intelligence, um, the technique to be able to help the English teachers who are actually uh, teaching or providing English materials to the children who are doing these activities to their students. I mean, not the children, the students at school. So artificial intelligence develop, I mean, the, the technique that we have developed this program is just like helping tool that they can use. So we are dealing with, oh, we are actually having this discussion with the teachers constantly so that they could, you know, use this um, 
take advantage of this technique that we came up with. But I'm just taking an example here, how it's uh, 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 perceived quite differently uh, among like different cultures or different sort of countries. But in Korea, where AI is one of the biggest talk of the town these days, how it's uh, used or like uh, interpreted is a little bit different. The artificial intelligence or, okay, is it going to replace the English teacher? I mean, if what if I have this English artificial uh, intelligence based speaker at home, does that mean that I don't have to send my child and spend extra money uh, for my child's sort of hagwan fee anymore. So with this $200 worth uh, the speaker, that everything's okay. So my child is going to become a, you know, super fluent and accurate English user. Is it what it means? And a lot of marketers say yes. So it's it's quite that different. And also. Uh, I want to go back to uh, to the mom factor here too. So how basically the uh, the ELT ideas or the concepts is interpreted from uh, by the English teachers the, who are actually teaching and who know the who have this basic information and knowledge about ELT in Korea and how it's perceived by the moms are quite different. There's a huge gap, so there's not so much communication between them. I mean, is it really ironic? They're supposed to be the ones who are supposed to, uh, to to work together quite closely for the success of the overall English education for their own children, but they're going separate ways and they're trying to, especially the moms are trying to overtake um, the ELT process, uh, the overall process, and the, especially the, the, the textbook, um, the, all the decisions that they make in the curriculum designing or uh, like syllabus designing. So it's, it's quite ironic and sad in a way and very, um, uh, what is it, like not, not quite uh, desirable at all. So is it mom's factor? Is it a hindrance or is it a catalyst? So I think it should be seen uh, from both perspectives. Okay, so this is the methods uh, that I've, used in for my research. I research, I surveyed, I'm sorry, 38 moms as a total and six teachers. They're all Koreans. So these are the survey questions that I asked to moms. Uh, this was done an online survey. And first question is, how do you feel about teaching English to your children at home? Are you basically happy and do you find it helpful? And second, what do you do for your children's English education at home? Do you read books to your children? Or so tell me anything that you do for you know, to teach English to your children. So teach is not really a proper word to use, I would say like facilitate should be the word, but um, moms don't really feel that way. So, and where do you get information and tips on teaching English to your children? And which areas do you try to focus on in your children's English education? Is it speaking or communicative skills or reading comprehension or what else? And they came up with some interesting idea. And which areas do you get the most help from those mom's English experts or the content providers? Is it like reading skills, how to teach reading skills? Or is it, is it speaking skills or activity? Um, and the next question was, how much do you apply those ideas to your teaching? So it's all for practical reason. They exist for practical reasons, but is it really practically used? I was quite curious about it. And what are some of the challenges that you feel? Come on, so you can be honest with me. And they were very kind enough to uh, provide quite candid sort of ideas or like feelings about it. And there was some uh, follow-up interviews and live Q&A on social media, on neighbor portal um, uh, system. And uh, survey to teachers. So basically like very simple questions. Do you think the mom's English is helpful? Is it a good thing to go with? Or if you don't think so, please tell me what makes you think so, what makes you think it's not very helpful and any suggestions. And again, they were very busy, you know, ever since this pandemic um, started, these teachers are so busy. I'm sure you would know, of course, better than anybody else to come up with, you know, dealing with the technological problems and everything. So they were very busy, but uh, I was really uh, happy. I mean, very, very, very uh, lucky actually to be able to, um, you know, get some like really uh, like, you know, the detailed sort of answers from them. I'm gonna sh uh, share them with you later. All right, so the, let's go to the, the results first. Um, uh, first, first question, how much, uh, how do you feel about teaching English to your children at home? 
And out of 35 responses, uh, they could choose only one uh, item out of those, um, you know, the, 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 uh, the examples that I presented there, uh, right, the elements. And 18 out of those 35 people said they're frustrated. They're quite frustrated rather than happy or excited. And fairly stressed out was, you know, eight people said that. And confused, five people. And, but I was surprised to see actually four people, as many as four people said, rather enjoyable. I, I have a lot of fun, you know, using English or teaching English to my children at home. Um, but in depth, uh, this is another um, important sort of implication that I've noticed uh, from this talk that I had with them, you know, afterwards. They said they found it really interesting because they were really enjoying learning itself. But when it comes to applying it to your children, it was a different story. And let's get to that a little bit later. Okay, second question was, what do you do at home for your children's English education? And out of 38 responses, I just let them watch English videos. So basically they just don't do anything. Just turn on the uh, you know, YouTube, they go to the YouTube and they let them watch their favorite English materials on YouTube. And that's all that they do. So 35 people said that they do that. And reading English books to the kids or with the kids, again, 35 people do uh, said that. By the way, um, these children, they aged uh, ranged from the age uh, ranged from two to nine. They're really young learners. And uh, 15 people said that they try to talk in English to their children or with the children. Uh, they, tr they said they try. That doesn't necessarily mean that they actually do that a lot though, but it, it, they're making an effort. And again, eight people said that they play simple games. Um, actually, they learn these about these games or ideas or tips from these content providers on Instagram or YouTube. And so they want to you know, uh, practice it with their children. But uh, again, there was a problem later. And uh, eight people said that, so honestly, I don't do anything. And there's a reason why they did so, so, okay. And the third question was, where do you gain information basically? And uh, 28 people said that uh, they watch this YouTube contents and they learn from them. And uh, next to that, it's uh, T, uh, Instagram was the second most, uh, second most popular uh, source of the, uh, their language, I mean, the learning or teaching information or knowledge. And there's mom cafes. Uh, I'm sure you have heard of mom cafes uh, in Korea. Almost every district, regional district in Korea, like Ku, Yongsan, Ku, Gangnam, Ku, Seot, not that huge. Its district is rather small sort of unit uh, in, 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 uh, in, in the region. And every region in Korea, like nationwide, not just in Seoul, but nationwide, every region has its own mom cafes. So moms, they, as soon as they move into that particular, uh, the neighborhood, the first thing that they do is join the community, mom's cafe community to, you know, gain some or receive some information and feedback from the moms who have lived there you know, for long enough. But which hospital should we go to or which sort of how um, should we go to? So is there any like uh, famous or good tutors out there? Please recommend somebody. All kinds of information is available there. Uh, so these mom cafes, there are some um, really more powerful mom cafes with more members like uh, the, the gap is huge, really, like um, hundreds of thousands of members join in one particular uh, uh, the mom cafe, mom, not mom, but mom cafe. Uh, they're, they become so strong, they are selling things there. They're selling books, they're selling some, you know, teaching or learning materials online so that these moms could, you know, get a pretty good deal on the, uh, through the community. So, Sometimes they get sponsored by the ELT industry, I mean, the, the companies of ELT industry, like publishing companies or some hagwans to sell their stuff on, you know, in their community to the members. So they are wielding some powers over this, 
uh, you know, the, the companies as well, not just over moms. So it has become so powerful. Sometimes they have some political, um, they make some political statements as well. So uh, yeah, Mom Cafe is one of the very prominent things that we have to pay attention to. It's, it's, it's quite interesting, very unique. And there are some cultural centers, which are like everywhere in Korea. And usually it's more like community colleges in America, I think you could learn like variety of different subjects or things as a hobby or more like a professional uh, career development reason, they could get an access to like different sort of education uh, programs there on cult in cultural centers. And there are lectures offline as well. There used to be so many lectures all the time, which used to keep me busy too. But, you know, since we're, this is like untacked, uh, uh, you know, the times, it's all stopped. So everything is online. So again, lectures are another uh, source of information uh, for these moms. So again, uh, so Instagram or YouTube, so social media is very powerful. And so which areas do you try to focus on? So what do you really want to learn? What is it that you want to like, learn the information about, like how to teach English to your children? First of all, uh, actually, the speaking and listening skills, communicative skills are the areas that the mothers would like to learn to uh, uh, like to learn the uh, about the, the skills, how to teach these skills to their children. So 32 people out of 38 people uh, said that they could they, it could overlap. They could choose like you know more than just one items in the answers. And the keeping them interested was the second most important factor to these moms when it comes to uh, in a mom's English at home. Because as a mom, well, of course you want to learn or having fun learning English from you, which is almost, you know, it's not that easy at all. But anyway, keeping them interested, like, like uh, keeping them motivated and, and interested in learning English was the second most important factor, the second most important thing for these moms. And the reading skills, because like I said, these children aged from two to nine, so phonics was a pretty big thing for them. So the reading is, is of course, quite uh, strongly emphasized in ELT in Korea, especially to teaching young learners. So uh, reading skills is is like phonics, of course, that includes phonics, of course, and then uh, the moms were very keen on that too. And uh, fourthly, learning attitudes and habits. By that, I mean, okay, you want to see that your child sits straight at the at the desk and stay focused on like learning and reading books for like 30 minutes, like nonstop. Okay, you're not supposed to get up. You're not supposed to have snacks. You're not supposed to say anything that is uh, irrelevant to whatever you're learning right now. So stay focused for as long as you can. So I would like to do something to make sure that my children, uh, you know, have that kind of like, like good student sort of like attitude or posture. So can I do that really? So could you please help me how to uh, help me uh, on uh, making sure that my children is like, to, you know, grow up to be like a good student who stay focused all the time. Okay, that's uh, another thing that uh, the moms actually mentioned themselves and grammar teaching. I mean, isn't it really interesting? Their kids are really young, two, three, four, five, six, nine. Okay, they're only two nine-year-olds, uh, but still, these parents who answer that I think grammar teaching is very important. Maybe I should start doing something about it right now. Like, okay, okay that's that's uh, from these mothers who have like four-year-old children. What do you think it's coming from? I would say it's coming from their own learning experience because we grow up uh, in Korea learning English and being tested all the time. So competition, is a big concern there. And frustration, anxiety is, is always there. It's, it's a huge hindrance actually in our, like, you know, to make sure that our uh, learning English sort of uh, is successful. Because it's, I mean, you always feel that I'm not good enough. Maybe I'm not good enough to speak my own and I'm, you're like, too sensitive about your accuracy. That's exactly what I'm doing right now. So I keep monitoring my own speech and my utterance all the time when I know that most of you, I would like to believe so, but most of you would think that, okay, just forget about it. Just keep going and then tell me what whatever you, you know, prepare to tell us. The content more matters more, not really the grammatical, you know, the little nitty gritty things. We don't really care about it. 
that's how I felt the most native speakers would feel in uh, their communication with non-native speakers like Koreans. But Koreans don't really feel it that way, as you must know very well. Accuracy is very important for us. And that's why when you are in a situation where you're supposed to say something in English to the English speaker, it's okay. You could use you know, gestures and hand gestures, facial expressions to get your ideas across to the other person to you know communicate basically. But when you know that there's an, one more Korean in the company, in the sp same space, you feel like so nervous, too nervous to say anything. Um, uh, 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 fearing that the other Korean would, you know, underestimate you, would think that, okay, this person is, is nothing. They, they would look down on me, they would put me down. So you have this fear that, that comes with psychological, I think it's, uh, it's a big hurdle that we have to overcome, but I think it is there. So these moms, they grew up or they grow up to be, uh, grow up with that kind of anxiety. So grammar was, of course, the major thing that, that was expected to uh, of these moms as English learners to you know to achieve, to be perfect, to you know have the perfect score in school. So maybe that kind of mentality is deeply rooted in their own learning experience. I think so. Maybe that's one of the reasons why they think it's quite important to start learning grammar from very early age. But we know that it's not quite true. But it's awfully difficult to persuade moms that it's not true. So it's okay to relax. Kids are kids. They have plenty of time to learn and have fun. So it doesn't have to be like hundred meter sprint. It could, should be a like, you know, lifelong journey and marathon. And to be honest, I myself as an English learner myself came to realize that in earnest, not that long ago, all my life, I've been really nervous about having to speak something in English in public. So um, I think I understand how these moms feel about you know, English education itself as a whole, not just for their children, but, you know, the English education from A to Z, it has to be done a certain way. You have to be accurate. So they want to make sure that the child grow up to become like native, like fluent and native, like accurate English users. Okay. And then writing again, along with grammar, four moms said that writing education is very important. Writing um, uh, instruction is quite important. So in many English um, academies in Korea, they uh, say so proudly, we teach writing to our um, you know, the first grade students and ask them or force them to write uh, the diaries or the journals every single day in English, at least one page long. And we force them to do that. And that's how we, you know, make sure that your child, uh, your children, uh, receives really quality English education. So, but I, I don't really believe that it's it's done in a right manner in Korea. Writing is of course very important, but not that way, right? So children are heavily, heavily stressed out and pressured. I I keep hearing from the kids too, and then these days kids are in Korea. They're becoming more and more expressive. I think that's a good thing in a way uh, to to express their like you know anxiety and agony they have to uh, feel because of their mom's pressure. So yeah, it's 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 that that is part of reality. And number five, uh, which areas did you get the most help? And majority of people are like thirty six. Uh, most number of people they said I get a lot of help in choosing books, uh, English books to read to my children or with my children. So reading books to the children, in that area, I get most help. So, uh, actually, it's probably because these content providers or content creators, they what they do is they get sponsored from these book publishers, but which is great. They have huge selection of such variety of different books for different levels, uh, different grades. It's just amazing. And we have this E, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, the library, they're really easily available. So um, they present books uh, on their contents, uh, on their YouTube contents. So these are the books that you're supposed to be reading to your child right now. If your child is three-year-olds, then this is the book for you. If your child is four-year-olds who just finished phonics, four-year-olds finished phonics, 
then this is the book that you have to tackle you know, as the next book. And the next book will be this. So they uh, actually show the certain roadmap that the moms are supporting. And um, a lot of times, yes, it works to, it makes sense actually, uh, and certain uh, to a certain extent, but on the other hand, uh, what if my child is not interested in dinosaurs? What if my child is not quite keen on numbers or sports? Sports is not my daughter's thing, but what if this popular uh, content creator insists that, okay, this, yay, go to the ballpark. This book is the book for your child right now in a very strong manner, then the moms are confused but they usually follow their advice and buy these books. So they actually do sell those books on, you know, they, they put the link on there too. So they actually do get a lot of uh, information and they, they learn about how to teach vocabulary and grammar of those storybooks to your children. When it is not quite right, when your child is not quite at that stage yet, to absorb and, and, and acquire those uh, language skills, but still moms are overly ambitious sometimes and they get confused. But uh, next to that is learning different activities. They get tips a lot, a lot of tips uh, about what kind of activities are there that could actually try with their children. And understanding the child psychology is the next thing in, in, the, in the list there. 17 people said that, okay, I get a lot of help to understand my child's psychology. Well, I think it's put in a very fancy way, but uh, uh, because of the word psychology, but actually they just want to get along with their children because they know that their child is suffering. They, their child is not having fun learning English from them, the mothers, but they feel like they have to do this unless uh, they want, you know, uh, then I mean, otherwise they will see that their children will, you know, lag behind because they're not sending their children to Hagwan or school on regular basis or daily basis like before. So they don't know how other kids are doing. So they're like the, the sense of, uh, what is it, the nervousness? They're, they're more nervous and they're more worried and concerned. What if my child is doing some, uh, is not doing something that everybody else is doing? So they want to make sure that they do everything at home. So, but uh, in, in, in that course, also, they are so concerned about how they are reacting to it because they get constantly in a fight. Mother, children, they fight all the time. And English is one of the big factors that sort of, you know, instigate such uh, the conflicts between mom and children. And there's teaching vocabulary and speaking and grammar. Again, grammar is always there. Okay, how much do you apply the information and knowledge in teaching your children? So. Okay, let's say you are learning so much, like you said, but is it really helpful practically? Do you actually get to use them in, uh, to your children? And uh, 20 people said that uh, a little bit, just a little bit, like what? Playing a game, maybe once a month, maybe? That's what they said, actually. So it's not like they're not doing anything at all they're doing something, but not much. So just a little bit. That's what majority of people said. And 13 people said, never. I really appreciate their honesty. They said, I watch and listen to these contents, but, and at that time, while I, would, while I am exposed to these lectures or you know, the talks on the social media, I get fascinated. I think, wow, I wish I had learned English that way that type of idea. So it is fascinating and I always get deeply impressed by the contents. But when the thing is over and I turn around and face my child, okay, how am I supposed to apply this to my child? It's a different story. So they just don't do anything at all because they're too afraid. That's what they said. And slightly above average, yes, I try to apply some of the tips and idea or, or teaching ideas in, in teaching English to my children. Four people said that. And almost everything, one person said that. I try almost everything that I learned to uh, teach English to my child who is only five years old. Okay. And so what are some of the challenges they, uh, according to their answers? Okay. I think th this 
this is the part that I would like to really uh, hear your opinions on too. First, um, a lot of people said that I lose patience too easily. So my kid is, is not like the, the content providers, the proud daughter. I mean, these content providers, they sometimes they show their own children's English performance. So this is how my child learned English. So you can teach your English to become like my daughter or like my, my, my son, isn't he great? So they are boasting their children's sort of uh, English performance online. And of course, that's one of the, the proofs or evidence that this content provider is doing something right, right? So um, I look, but these parents actually get stressed out and frustrated because of that, because they see the huge gap between the child on YouTube and my child in my own room. So I lose pay too easily. I just want to rush and to see the, uh, the fast improvement or progress, but that's not what's happening. I find myself being too harsh and pushy to my children. I'm kind of, I was glad to hear this. At least these parents are aware of their own behavior. And I feel anxious to see fast progress. And, and the next thing, I just don't know if I'm doing it right. I try to apply those tips and, you know, information or, or knowledge to teach English to my child, but am I doing this right? I'm not too sure about that. And there's no way that this, they could actually directly, con well, they can contact, they could ask questions to the, the content creators, but it's not like, you know, it doesn't happen every day or often enough. And it's extremely difficult to keep my child interested and motivated. They just keep losing interest and focus. And my English is too poor. I don't know how to, I've never been successful in learning English my life ever. So I just don't know what it's like to be able to, you know, uh, successful in learning a language, learning a foreign language, even at the early age. So my English is too poor to be able to communicate with my children. And my child doesn't feel comfortable having me as a teacher. It's so obvious and it makes me feel so uh, nervous too. And I feel overwhelmed by so much contents. I feel lost. It is very true. I must say, there's at least 1,000 English mom's cafes out there in Korea. If you go to Wikipedia and you could uh, you know, search the, uh, the how many mom cafes out there, the number keeps growing. And it's already based on what I've found, it's already like 700, 800, and just only like registered mom cafes alone. But there are like many more a lot more um, unregistered mom, mom cafes out there too. So they're overwhelmed with so much information and knowledge. And this is what I found more from the follow-up interview. But again, on the positive side, I've learned so much, especially about teaching reading skills, but it was almost important, uh, impossible to apply what I've learned to teach my child. And I don't know what went wrong. And I try to purchase all the books. Again, it really makes them spend a lot more money than before. Recommended by the mom's English experts. Like I said, they don't want to lag behind. So they, the least, the least thing that could do is to you know, purchase all those books, but don't know what to do with them. And most of the English educational contents that I see on different media forms are just amazingly wonderful. They're great. However, following their advice and actually putting them into practice is a different story. And I wish there could be a curriculum set. This is what a lot of moms said like, unanimously. Like uh, there could be a curriculum set up with small steps for children who learn English at home. Meaning I wish there could be a way that my child could receive some quality English education online without having to go to hagwons or some educational institutes or organizations. So they want to replace the actual ELT programs. Hmm, okay, that's, that's what they are really wishing for. So the implication, what is really going on here? So mom's English experts on social media, what do they talk about? how to teach English to children through activities and course books, I'm summarizing it. And what do they also show? Their own children, it's English performances, which sometimes is a little bit too um, intimidating. And what makes them different from the teachers in schools uh, or academies? Well, this is uh, very important, I think. As parents themselves, these content providers, they talk from the parents' perspectives. So I know how it feels, I know how frustrating it must be for you 
to deal with your children at home, right? But let me give you all the tips. And this is the thing that you are supposed to be doing to your child right now. So that's how they usually approach the moms. Not all the time, but a lot of times. That's why so many moms in the survey answer that, okay, I feel like inundated and I feel totally overwhelmed. And that's not a positive thing to happen. And I'm more lost. I feel more lost than ever before. Uh, is it? Yes. And do you think mom's English education has always positive effect on the child's English learning? This is the question to the teacher. And out of six teachers, five said, nope, flat out, nope. And one teacher said, yes. Okay, let's see. The teacher's views, the, what about the positive points? Yes, I think it has some positive effects because the child's progress can be more closely observed and monitored so that the result can be, whatever the findings are, it, they could be reflected in my, um, the process of designing the curriculum and syllabus and class activities. So it could be helpful in that way. And parents can help the child keep up with school activities. What if this child is a little bit behind uh, other children, other students in school uh, in terms of vocabulary acquisition. And what if moms could help the child with vocabulary acquisition through some activities or drills at home, it could be really easy, I mean, uh, 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 helpful really overall. And when the mom can pay close attention to the curriculum and have better, to gain some better understanding of how English learning happens, then it would be easy to uh, to to try like different ideas and different activities in the class, and and then as a result, the child see the child seems more encouraged to learn more. They're more motivated to learn more when they know that their moms are paying attention to their learning process and the contents as well. When the mom informs the teacher of the current level, what sort of stage the child is going through. Um, and the, the child's English ability, that it usually helps designing the class activities and uh, contents. But it should be based on the premise that the moms and teachers, they communicate quite um, you know, actively, but that doesn't really happen that easily in Korea. And what about those no's? It only has negative impacts, I believe so, because some parents are so easily swayed by different opinions and ideas that they are exposed to. So they just don't know what to think and they just keep demanding, okay, you better do this right, teacher. So I just keep, I have right to demand you to teach my child right to be, uh, so that uh, my child could become like fluent English speaker in three months. I paid you that much. And these are the activities you're supposed to be doing right now, isn't it? So they become so nosy. Um, yes, it has, it has been like that for quite, uh, quite a few years, I believe. And some parents are excessively demanding, insisting on some groundless information or pseudo knowledge they must have gained on some social media. So some content creators, uh, they, would dare say things they don't believe is true as long as they believe it's what the parents would like to hear. So they just want to pamper the uh, parents uh, by selling them some products or they could be very commercialized. But I would be happy to say that that's not quite really like general sort of phenomena. I'm, I'm very pleasant actually uh, to say that we are having more and more really highly qualified English teachers or mom's English experts uh, becoming more engaged or like, like involved in this ELT industry. So a lot of moms, they do apply to go to um, the grad schools they teach uh, where they teach uh, TESOL programs. So I think it's a very desirable phenomena. They want to be more seriously committed to it. And some parents strongly insist on their own false beliefs so this is what I believe. But when they clash, the parents' beliefs and the teachers' beliefs, when they clash, then it could be very like, seriously problematic. So um, this is how I sort of interpret it, uh, the positive effects of mom's English at home. Like I said, in the very beginning, mom's English, even though moms are the groups of people that you don't want to deal with, really, and that you don't want to stay away from, and because they could be 
uh, unbelievably demanding, and they're not very easy to communicate with. However, as the mom specter is becoming like growing to become more powerful and like like bigger, there's no other choice but us to face it as as it is and to to deal with it. Uh, in many different ways. So these are some of the positive points that I found in mother uh, factor here. Parents can gain better understanding of their children's development in, uh, in learning English. So this is how English speaking happens. So it takes time. There's silent period and you're not supposed to bother your child. You're not supposed to be too pushy during this time period. You have to you know, give them some break. So if the child, a parents could understand that, then they wouldn't have to, you know, push their children that much. So this is one of the positive things that we can expect if these moms receive uh, information and knowledge in the correct, I mean, the, the accurate manner or accurate, uh, accurate information. And the parents can build stronger rapport with their children. And uh, which will result in in you know, higher uh, or increase in the children's English competence if everything goes right, and the parents can help continue practicing the knowledge at home, like one of the teacher. I mean, some of the teachers ha uh, have mentioned, and therefore parents and teachers can cooperate to ensure better learning environment to the child. So that would may, that may sound a little too idealistic, but I think at least we should set a goal somewhere because I think we have to work with it, not really without it. So, but there are other like, you know, uh, concerns that we have to consider that without accurate understanding of ELT mechanism or basic knowledge, they could easily misunderstand or misuse even the methods. The parents, I mean, the parents can feel pressured to make sure that the child doesn't get behind because it's his mom's English sort of, you know, this all uh, the atmosphere is not always friendly at, at, uh, all the time. And the parents can often feel overwhelmed by so much information and knowledge uh, and surrounding them, which would uh, cause excessive amount of stress. And without due understanding or the proper understanding of ELT, basically the child's performance level and the guy, they could guide them in the wrong direction. So that's how I sort of see uh, the mom's English in a not so negative way. So what's missing basically two things I would like to suggest, the education for moms. It should be provided by TESOL programs or like TESOLers or like some like real experts out there. They should help the understand help uh, those moms and parents who are eager to do something to help their children learn English in a better way. Then we really have to help them. And uh, and then I wish there could be like more active, better communication between teachers and moms. Those two things are the uh, could be the the main things that I would like to suggest as the solution. So uh, in a nutshell, TESOL. Parents, they join the TESOL programs, but they are already uh, experienced in dealing with their own children, so they have their own preconceived ideas. It's awfully difficult to break them. So what if we come up with the programs, like, different, like separate programs for parents, which would add child development pedagogy or child psychology, or et cetera, for parents in the course? And at the same time, we seek ways to enlighten those parents on how to better cooperate with the teachers. So it's not like they don't want to cooperate with the teachers, but they just don't know how to. So I believe that those are the things that we could try out from the TESOLers perspective. Yes, that would be all that I prepared to say in my presentation. It's already 2.02 almost two o'clock already. Uh, so thank you so much for listening to my presentation. And if you have any suggestions or ideas, questions, please, I would love to answer. I have a question, Bo Young. That was a really, really terrific presentation. And um, I think this is great research. Uh, it goes back to um, one of the early findings by um, Coleman and his panel in 1966 that in um, highly developed countries, um, 
social factors are bigger than school factors in academic achievement. Um, so I think you've done some really great work here. My question is this, uh, and I'm wondering about um, this suggestion that I often give to parents. They say, they'll say to me, oh, you know, and then they ask me about that, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So anyway, I say, I say, why don't you, why don't you ask an international person or why don't you ask me to come to dinner one night? Uh -huh. So one of the questions I have is that has your research looked into how much these mothers or how much these families are actually trying to um, bring people who speak another language or come from a different cultural background into their children's lives? Mm -hmm. um, well, actually, one of uh, the things that that uh, to be happy about in terms of English providing you know better English learning environment to our children is that parents are willing to change their attitudes because possibly because uh, they receive so much information and they are exposed to all these different ideas provided by these content providers or content creators on social media. Uh, thankfully, these experts are saying that relax, you don't have to rush things. And I'm quite happy about that. And uh, so that sort of have uh, affected those moms who used to have different ideas to change their minds and attitudes so they could be more open and they want to provide more like communicating experience or opportunities to their children. So that's why they want to take the whole family overseas, you know, for like pleasure and to experience, you know, different cultures and everything. But at that time, again, my suggestion actually is to be more like, uh, uh, to, to, to tell them what to say. I mean, to practice those English phrases they could actually use in communicating with people from overseas when they actually go overseas. For example, when they go to the Philippines and the beach area, what if they meet some uh, people from Austra Australia and then they could say, of course, start with hi and where are you coming from and blah, blah, blah. And you know, the conversation goes on and on and on, right? So what if the children know what to say to you know, in, in the question or to answer some of the, the expected, like usually frequently asked questions from the foreigners. They look, what if they could practice beforehand? And the parents are also practicing together as more like a family activity because they set the schedule first, right? And that they could be more like detailed in planning out the actual communication setting. I think they could be more confident and they, they could be like they could be able to uh, you know deal with this deal with the this communicating situation more effectively when they're prepared. So I I one of those people who believe in the power of preparation. As an EFL learner myself, I was once invited to this fundraising um, party in America, uh, in Pasadena, California, where I was the only Asian. Uh, and my daughter was going to this uh, uh, the high school and she really wanted me to take part in, in you know, to, to go mingle with people there, which I'm never good at. Even in Korean, it doesn't really matter. I'm, I'm, you may not believe me, but I'm really shy, basically. <laughs> so, but even though teaching how to communicate in English to children or the college students or, you know, in general was my job. And it has been my job for like 30 some years, but I would still, I still found myself being so nervous among these, you know, people who I don't know at all. And they're so tall and uh, I was way down there that they didn't even bother of my existence. They never cared. And I felt so like intimidated. So on the first day I just came home without you know, saying a word with anybody. So you know, there was a, like, you know, the, the catering service people, they were like walking around, you know, offering the drinks, right? So I'm not a like, strong alcohol drinker, but all I could do was just you know, taking sips like all the time. And then I felt so, you know, like, okay, a little tipsy, but I felt good, but that was it. And I came home and feeling really bad. I'm not really up to what I been talking to, you know, my learners or students. 
I'm so terrible communicator. So the next day I was supposed to go there again. And this time I set up a strategy in this uh, uh, classroom, I mean, the, the bathroom, I practiced what I could say. Okay, what is it that I usually say to my students? First, make eye contact and handshake, firm handshake, not dead fish handshake. And then start with question or self-introduction. And there were things that I would teach my students to use like strategically. And yeah, maybe I should, it's my time. I mean, it's, this is the perfect time for me to try out those things myself. So I got out of the bathroom and I looked around the, where I was like this. I never wanted to really make eye, eye contact with anyone because I was so nervous and you know passive in every way. But I was prepared the next day. So I looked up and looked around to make eye contact with one person, with anyone. And there was this one guy coming from across the hall and then and the next strategy, next step in my strategy, smile. And then reach out and say, hi. And then self-introduction, my name is Bo Young Lee and I came from Seoul, Korea. And then question, are you a parent too? Because it was a high school. Are you a parent too? And this guy said, yeah, I am. My name is Bill. And then, okay, we started out having this conversation. So when did you come to, uh, to the States and did you just arrive or blah, 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 blah. And then we started talking about Korean food and Korean like political situation and things like that. And things that I was a little bit knowledgeable about. And he was very interested in the, our conversation. And the next thing you know, as just looked around to find that we were surrounded people there who were <laughs> eager to jump in this conversation because we were having so much fun. And I would never ever forget that sort of the feeling of the sense of happiness or the kind of achievement that I felt at this moment. So my point here is uh, just trying to make sure that the, your child is exposed to English speaking uh, environment uh, or the different the people from different culture just telling them to do so is is of course very important but the next thing that maybe the tesolers or the the, the actual experts should uh, uh, jump in is that maybe you could teach them or let them know what to say like step by step I'm sure there are some like steps in questions that you could try out with the students so that you could uh, draw out the students sort of active like engagement in the conversation. For example, you might, you might want to start with uh, like yes and, and then like one word answer question and then the phrase answer question. You know, there's, there's gotta be a steps for that of course. I, I think that's how I, what I believe. So um, my, this is what I do with, with, with the learners, try to provide the actual things that they could try out because a lot of times they get lost. Yeah, exposure is of course important, but how? What am I supposed to be doing right now with my five-year-old son? So that's where TESOLERS could come in handy, I think. From a, a native speaker perspective too, I think one of the really important things to do, and I'm good at showing this to my students, is to make mistakes. And um, that, and that when, you, when you say something, you get something all boggled up, you can repair it. And yeah. that's one of the strategies that I teach to my students. You know, wh what did you say? I'm sorry. Oh, oops. Um, I meant da 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 da. da. Yeah. Right. And right. I think that's. I think it's really, really important for uh, kids to see that. You know, mm. and it's it's good to see kids try to struggle with Korean too. I, you know, mm. more international people struggle with Korean too, as I just did. Absolutely. You know, and um, they they can see wow hard for him to speak Korean. It's hard for me to speak English too. We're in the same boat, you know? Uh -huh. And so, but he's trying, you know? Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah, Ryan, so you, you did that in Pasadena. Yeah. <laughs> and Jessamine has Yes, her can I jump in and ask a question? I, I wrote down eight questions, but I'm gonna try to just like mash together two of them into one question and not bother everybody with all the others. But, um, I, this is very, very interesting. And I wondered, are there any other academic subjects that moms in Korea are, ex that, well, not expected. Are there any other topics that they uh, feel like they should teach at home? And are these moms you talk to, are these moms who 
are also sending their kids to Hagwon or mm. are they not going to Hagwon? I, I, and the context is I teach in a province where a lot of my students don't go to Hagwon. So I'm, I, I'm getting the feeling that these are moms in Seoul or in Gyeonggi-do. Um, oh. And that that's also somewhat different from, from in my area, but, but we are, we've been trying to reach out to moms and mm. we've been trying to offer some, some online programs that are for moms and kids together. So I'm very interested in, in finding out more about what's useful for them. Mm-hmm. So yeah, are there any other topics that they have to teach at home and, and that, where does this connect to Hagwans? Mm. First of all, you mean other than English? Mm, yeah, are there any other topics other than English? Oh, they, math. Yeah, okay. Math. Yeah. And uh, activity-wise, there are, I was really surprised and, and quite uh, deeply impressed to see that there are so many, there has, I mean, it, it, it's my biggest sort of weakness. So I'm always uh, excited to see that how you can learn, you know, math in a fun way. So math is definitely there. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, yeah, I would say math and English mm-hmm. that they, they want to do something about. And uh, and then the next question was, uh, do they go to Hagwon or not? Doesn't really matter. Doesn't okay. really matter. They want to do something at home. And it, it's really not just in Seoul area, but it's more like national thing. Mm-hmm. It happens everywhere. Like I said, every district has Mam Cafe and they're very active mm-hmm. and very demanding and quite stubborn sometimes. Mm-hmm. They're not, again, each Mam Cafe, the, the prominent ones, there are some like more, uh, active mom cafes than others. There are like but tens or fifteen uh, really active mom cafes out there. Uh, they do this live broadcast all the time, every single day, morning, afternoon, at night. They have this live uh, broadcast on Instagram, so which is really amazing. And th- this uh, community is run by three moms, and uh, these moms are quite active in in, in uh, making this business transactions with all these different companies in ELT so that they could actually sell stuff uh, at a like a lower price, but uh, they want to make sure the quality is there. It's not like just anything just to make money. So that's, that's one thing to be happy with, I think. Uh, so these mom cafes are like, this is internet, uh, that's, you know, really wired. So it's like na- a national thing. So like you just mentioned, um, just, uh, just, I mean, um, some moms are, they know, they, they feel like they have to do something about it but they feel more frustrated and uh, like, like intimidated to do anything to try out because there's no basic knowledge how it really happens. Okay, if you listen to certain English material for five hours every day, does that make you a native speaker? A lot of people would still believe so. It's really amazing. Uh, I, I, I have my own radio show these days. It's, it's been a year now uh, on EBS FM. It's level one English you know, conversation program. And I have 20 minutes every day. And the thing that I'm trying out here is listen and repeat. And then you know, a lot of times people just listen to the radio programs and that's it. They don't speak you know, during the broadcast, but I encourage the, the, the audience to speak together with some you know, upbeat background music. And uh, their response was just amazing. I never really expected to receive that much uh, like uh, you know, positive reviews. The people aging from, uh, what is it? Six-year-olds all the way up to 85-year-olds. Uh, like former, I used to be a professor. I used to be a, a, a teacher. And they you know, write their comments on the, the chat board saying, I've never experienced speaking, practicing speaking all my life. And this is the first time ever that I've practiced speaking, listening to the radio program. And I keep encouraging the the audience, okay, you're not the only one who is shy in saying anything in English. I feel nervous all the time, but if we do this all together, everyone else is doing it. So why don't you join us? So that's kind of, <clears throat> sorry, to, uh, that's, that's what I say or tell my, my audience every day. So I don't really think there's no, any like special uh what is it the secret the magical way to encourage learners to you know practice speaking or communicative skills but you got to really keep approaching them like reaching out like so yeah. moms are eager to learn 
but you have to start from the very bottom though. They're, they're very shy. They are yes. extremely shy and their children are usually much less shy. Mm -hmm. And so it's been a learning curve, figuring out how to work with both of them on the yes. same screen. Yeah. So if the mothers can overcome this shyness and then I, if they get the taste of it, um, oh, okay, I am becoming like less and less shy, then they can understand, okay, this is how language in, in the process works. And that's one of the positive effects of mom's sort of involvement in English education of their children. So I think it's very important the learner, I mean, the teachers, even Korean English teachers or moms to experience the positive learning experience firsthand. Quiet. Did you guys have lunch yet? Food? What's that? <laughs> it's, it's apple and snack time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if we were all together in sukte, just like before, we would have probably, you know, have some you know, munchies that like, like everywhere. Yeah. I really miss that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, gosh. Well, okay. Well, thank I, I asked so that Oh, thank you very much. I, I was really afraid uh, that I was like, uh, you know, taking too much of your time. Thank you very much for coming in. This is all recorded, right? Yep. Okay. I'm going to post it on my social it media. Good. Okay. Hi, David Schaefer. All right. Thank you very much, Diane Lee, Ibo Young, Yu Myung. Thanks, Bo Young. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Feel free to go to Discord and continue the conversation if you want. If you don't, juice and snack time. Off you, everyone. Thank you so much.